Chapter Fourteen of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen, in which Willie Hardy, the light villain of the story, appears upon the scene. Claude was not the only boy whose first communion was put off. On the second day of the retreat, Willie Hardy was told by Father Maynard to wait another year. Willie was a remarkably pretty boy, with an innocent face and a constant smile. He was quiet, and had a habit of taking his hat off, whether to father, prefect, or professor, with the prettiest air imaginable. He had entered college three days after Claude, and thus far was a favorite with the faculty, and the most unpopular youngster in the yard. Willie was, in a way, a diplomat. He showed his velvet to his teachers, his claws to the boys. When the news spread that he was not to make his first communion, there was great surprise, but among his mates little regret. I said just now that he was disliked. It would have been more proper to say that he was held in contempt. Willie Hardy was an habitual liar. He noticed Claude closely on the day of our lively friend's return to college, and it struck his fancy that perhaps Claude, who now tripped about as though his limbs had never known injury, had pretended lameness, and thus saved himself from the imputation of being considered unfit to approach the blessed sacrament. To Willie this seemed very probable. He considered Claude a bad boy had claude not laughed at his lisp had claude not poked him in the ribs and crushed his stiff hat all these things in willie's eyes were very wicked now the step from it may be so in willie's mind to it is so had been worn down so effectually by constant lying that they were almost flush with each other i say frank he cried, running up, flushed and eager and pretty, to Elmwood, who was talking with Collins. "'Did you hear the news?' "'What's the matter now?' asked Frank. "'Lightfoot's thickness was all in his eye.' "'Thickness? Thickness?' echoed Frank. "'What the mischief does anybody care about Lightfoot's thickness?' "'I didn't say thickness,' cried Willie, with a captivating smile i said here he took breath and with an effort said thickness i really think that willie's lisp had been a help to him in his career of lying it was a charming lisp and grown folks had been so much taken up with the prettiness of his pronunciation as to pay little or no attention to what he said thus many of his arabian statements had been allowed to pass unchecked while people fell into ecstasies over his lisp perhaps you mean sickness sissy said frank unsoftened by the blandishments of the pretty boy yes lightfoot played off he wasn't to make his first communion anyhow father maynard told me so himself he said that he'd rather let me go than Claude, because Claude was the worst boy in the yard. At the end of this clear and accurate statement of fact, Willie folded his hands and looked positively celestial. Frank and Rob, on the other hand, looked of the earth, earthly, Frank's face in particular becoming very grim. "'Are you lying, as usual?' "'Cross my heart!' protested Willie, if the truth, and nothing else. Frank gave a growl, and catching his angelic informant by the collar, proceeded very rapidly toward the college building. "'What's the matter, Frank?' asked Willie, making no attempt to struggle. "'I'm going to Father Maynard's room with you to find out from his own lips if what you've said is true.' "'Father Maynard isn't in?' i saw him jumping on the street-car going downtown just two minutes ago heavings exclaimed collins who had kept abreast of frank there's father maynard standing at his window now and reading his breviary 
sissy if all your lies were glued together they'd make a walking track from here to san francisco i've a notion to put your head in the tub added frank no no please don't do that you'll spoil my new collar i take it back frank it was all a joke giving the sweet youth who by the way was highly perfumed a squeeze that elicited a shriek frank released his hold saying as he did so you'd better not tell that lie to any one else oh no frank i was just going to tell you how it was a joke when you rumpled my collar i'll not say another word about it and then willie with his sweet smile hurried away and before the end of recess had told the same story to nineteen or twenty boys of his own age it is no slight tribute to his reputation to add that not a single boy believed him several were good enough to tell him plainly and unequivocally that he was lying whereupon willie without change of colour or show of surprise would cross his heart and go on protesting the truth of every word it was seldom that his fancy hit upon so damaging a lie and he did not take into account that a lie aimed at a person's reputation is far more serious in its character than one that is harmful chiefly to the teller he learned this distinction that afternoon when the vice-president read him a homily before the class then took the youngster to his room and returned him five minutes later all in tears and sobs and blushes claude was the last to hear the story and he laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks after willie's whipping he was the first and only boy to condole with the talented liar it was a joke protested willie between his sobs then he borrowed ten cents of claude and owes him that money to this day the months of may and june passed quickly claude kept mr russell's prediction in mind and he rose each day with the determination to be as good as possible but it was one thing to resolve and another to carry out the resolution mr grace was very gentle with him for he really and thoroughly sympathized with the little boy in his trial but for all that he thought it his duty to call claude to task quite frequently and claude it must be said took his punishment with an equal mind in the yard claude often ran foul of the more dignified young students and on the whole his record was not satisfactory i do my thinking after it's all over he used to say and then he would go off to confession and relieve himself of his scruples even mr russell was sometimes discouraged see here claude he said one day when his impulsive friend had been within a little of being crushed under the heels of the larger boys in a football rush if you don't get some prudence into your head you'll never grow up to cultivate a moustache didn't i tell you that small boys are not allowed to play football with the big boys i didn't think sir well it's about time for you to take thought get your history my little man claude learned his twenty-five lines and that very afternoon on his way downtown to meet his sister escaped almost by a miracle from under the hoofs of a team of horses claude himself was inclined to despair but kate gentle and firm never gave up she waited and prayed for the day when her brother would awake to a sense of thoughtfulness and prudence at the closing exhibition our little friend won the silver medal in elocution the first premiums in history geography christian doctrine reading and spelling in latin in english grammar and in composition branches which require application he received no mention it is superfluous to add that his name was not recorded on the list of students distinguished for excellent deportment thus after three months at a catholic school we find claude still setting the same problem to frank elmwood trials and resolutions had had full play and yet no material change had taken place on the morning after the distribution of prizes frank elmwood called at claude's house i want to see your father said frank very shortly and in much excitement claude called his father and with a certain instinctive delicacy left the two alone in the parlour sir 
said frank after the customary interchange of greeting i came to ask you a great favour well winter and i and dan dockery and willie hardy and charles pearson are going to camp out for a few weeks at lake vesper about thirty miles from here a number of the college boys are to board at houses near us and as you know the collins people have a villa there and are within a few minutes walk of the place where we're going to pitch our tent now sir we have plenty of room for one more dockery and pearson are special friends of claude's and it would be splendid if you'd let claude come along all the fellows want it it's an outing what they call an outing said mr lightfoot stroking his chin reflectively i rather like the idea myself outing is such a thoroughly american way of doing things we've got over ten dollars worth of fireworks for the fourth of july sir and we're going to have a jolly bonfire and on the morning of the fourth we're going to have six american flags stuck about our tent excellent exclaimed mr lightfoot clapping his hand upon frank's back but you shall have a dozen flags and another ten dollars worth of fireworks i shall send them myself but what about claude may he come i'm decidedly in favor of it i'm highly pleased with what you've told me but on a question like that i must consult my wife and of course kate just wait one moment claude he called going to the door yes papa ask your mamma and sister to step this way for a moment mrs lightfoot whose ancestors had fought and bled for the cause of independence betrayed a curious want of interest concerning the number of american flags but was very searching in her question as to what measures had been taken for cooking sleeping accommodations and shelter frank gave sufficiently satisfactory replies and after a conference of some three-quarters of an hour mrs lightfoot and kate gracefully yielded their assent then claude was summoned how his eyes danced when he heard what had been decided upon he ran up to frank and pounded him affectionately on the back and frank smiled while smothering the pain for claude's strokes were as strong as they were affectionate now my dear said the mother i put you in full charge of frank as long as you are away and you are to obey him as you would me yes mamma i'll do it and added frank i'll be as careful of claude as i know how how are you off for hammocks asked mr lightfoot well the truth is sir i've been put to so much expense buying necessaries that i've put off getting such extras till next year since claude is going continued mr lightfoot it's my duty to take a share in the expenses we didn't count on that sir oh i'll do the counting now if you've time you might go down to carol and kennedy's notion store and get say three hammocks if they haven't any in stock they'll very willingly order them for you thank you ever so much sir the boys will be delighted it's the american way of doing things in the country said mr lightfoot and by the way when you and claude go downtown you might find something or other that hasn't occurred to me now for instance have you balls and bats we have an old ball and a couple of bats sir oh you must do better than that by baseball it's the national game here are ten dollars and you can buy whatever suits you in that line <laughs> i'm almost ashamed to take it sir you needn't hold back elmwood it's a kindness in you to take such an interest in my little boy and it's only just that i should help along of course you must keep account of expenses for provisions and the like and i'll pay my quota for that too claude who had been dancing in and out among the chairs now sprang forward eagerly come on frank it's near ten o'clock let's hurry down after those baseballs and hammocks if i am not mistaken carol and kennedy keep open till seven in the evening said papa so if you both hurry you may still get there before the store closes too intent upon his own plans to perceive this paternal joke claude almost pulled his friend out of the room he was seen a moment later clearing the fence at a bound and heard yelling at the top of his voice End of chapter fourteen